Hey, what's the largest problem you're facing right now with your junk removal business? Are you still researching the business and you're looking, hey, where do I get started? Are you not getting enough jobs? Are you slam busy and you're having to turn away work, but you don't know how to take it to the next level, how to hire crews and get more trucks? Are you worried that the crews you have aren't doing a great job or maybe even stealing from you? These are all problems that every junk removal business owner is gonna face as they grow. These are problems I've had and I've learned how to solve. The solutions can be found in the complete junk removal business training series. Grow your business, change your life with the JRA Complete Training Series. Welcome everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. It is Tuesday, 12 noon Eastern time. My name is Lee Godbold with Junk Removal Authority where we help junk removal business owners make more money and live a better life. So today, it is not actually live. I'm not coming to you live. This has been pre-recorded because I have a meeting going on uh, right now once a month. I'm a member of a group called Vistage. It's a group for uh, CEOs, business owners, entrepreneurs. I haven't participated in the last seven or eight months because we've been so busy with everything we've got going on, but now I'm able to uh, get back to it. So uh, the exciting thing is, is we still have an amazing show put together for you. I think it's something that's going to be very, very, very valuable to you. No matter what stage of business you're in, this is going to be something you're going to aspire to get to, and it's really going to help you uh, create an amazing junk removal business. So meanwhile, if, for those of you that are not in business yet, or you're in business and you want to uh, gain more knowledge and train your team better and kind of step your game up, make sure you check out our complete business package for those of you that are not in business. And for those of you that are already in business, check out the complete video training and testing series. There will be a link in this description uh, for more, to get more information on both of those offerings and products. Okay, so today's topic is uh, hiring a manager for your junk removal business. So those of you guys just starting, you're probably like, I I'm just trying to figure out how to manage this thing myself. Why am I worried about hiring a manager? We want to have a goal of something to work towards. Because I can tell you right now with junk doctors, very early on, uh, I brought in Christian, who's a business, uh, a business partner in junk doctors. Uh, he earned ownership over a period of time. And uh, he did so because he is the uh, general manager and uh, now the CEO of Junk Doctors. I spend no time at all on Junk Doctors, very, very, very little. I wanna start spending a bit more on it moving forward, like just a couple hours a month around some promotion and some advertising, some new advertising stuff we wanna start doing. But for the most part, the last two years, my focus has been 100% on JRA and on truck bodies, on the truck body division. I've paid almost no attention to junk doctors and it gives me a great income every single month simply because I have the systems and the manager and all in place. And now actually Christian has a manager underneath him. So we have a lot of redundancy going on. So that's what we want to build up. Uh, you're going to want to build up too. So there are two different types of managers. Uh, the first one you're going to get relatively quickly. The second one for many of you, it might be several years before you get one. The first type is a supervisor. The second one is a general manager or GM. The supervisor, you should develop this as soon as possible. The general manager, generally within five years. Now, we have had people that have been successful in past businesses and in past career, whatever, that had some extra money that hired a GM before they even opened. So before they actually opened, they had a general manager in place to run the day-to-day -day operations. It's very, that can be done uh, in a junk removal business. So what are the tasks of a supervisor? A supervisor, some of them are going to be checking guys in in the morning. Um, making sure tr trucks are, are clean. Deposit money to the bank account. Say deposits. Inventory, keep an inventory stocked.
and holding the team accountable for daily checklist. And then the, uh, one other thing is oftentimes it's going to be training new team members. So a supervisor, you can develop a supervisor within the first six months that you're in business and you should aim to have a supervisor within the first six months, definitely by the end of year one. What do you pay these individuals? Uh, this is typically uh, going to be uh, an, an hourly team member, somebody that's still on the truck a decent amount at least at first. and. You might also give them like 1% of sales potentially, but you're probably not gonna offer that at the start. You're gonna start out by essentially, uh, they're gonna make a few dollars an hour more than everybody else. And if you wanna move in that 1% of sales, then you possibly could later on, but don't do it right off the bat. This person needs to kind of earn that as they, uh, as they grow in this position. So that's what the supervisor is responsible for. So what's the difference between a super and a general manager? Oftentimes, your GM will first be your supervisor. Ideally, you hire this role uh, within, you promote within. If you do not, if you don't have somebody you think can be that supervisor or GM, then that individual should work in every single job within the company, especially on the, on the truck team is the main thing, uh, for a few months. These guys gotta get in there. They have to see jobs. They have to understand what truck teams are uh, going through. They have to understand how to load trucks, understand how to quote jobs. They've got to have been there and done that in order to get the respect uh, from the team that's going to be required for them to properly do their job. So a general manager, some tasks for a GM. A lot of times the GM when you first get started is going to be you, but what does the typical GM do? Well, he's gonna do daily dispatch and it's possible a supervisor you're gonna find there's gonna be a blend between the GM and supervisor from time to time. A supervisor might, instead of being on the truck, handle daily dispatch. Employee scheduling. Hiring, firing, training. I'll make training a separate one here. This is both ongoing as well as for new employees. Again, that could be a blended role between the super and the GM, but uh, normally you're gonna want your GM involved at least on ongoing training, if not the initial. Facilitates truck maintenance. Responsible for meeting budgetary sales and P&L goals. Assisting in the creation of marketing goals and the air execution. and forecasting new hires and trucks. A well-run junk removal business in a typical environment, non-COVID, non-supply issues, uh, will almost always or almost never have too few trucks or too few people. Now in this climate, People's a very, very hard thing right now. Uh, but if you're doing your job as forecasting, you're at least gonna be in a better position than if nobody was forecasting to start with and, and you waited to the last possible moment to hire or, or get an order a new truck. So this is typically what a GM, a general manager, is going to be uh, responsible for.
If you guys have any questions at all that uh, Mad Matt Mary, our great videographer and marketing uh, director, can handle, uh, make sure you post them in the comments. He'll answer what he can. If he doesn't know something, he'll get it to the per uh, person that does, and we'll get back with you on it. But he is monitoring this channel right now, so make sure to check it out. All right, so now, we, now that we have kind of the task on what these individuals do, we should talk about uh, compensation structure for both of these. We briefly mentioned it for supers. But what about a GM? Obviously, when you compare the two, the supervisor and the GM, there's a big difference in responsibility. As such, there should be a big difference in pay. A GM, at this point, you might be asking, well, if I have a GM, what am I doing? Typically, you're gonna to wanna to hire a general manager when uh, there's a few different circumstances. One is you're tired of doing most of the GM duties yourself and you, um, uh, you need to find somebody to kind of replace you. The second thing is if you're expanding, maybe you want to focus all your time and efforts on growing the top line, getting out there, networking, meeting people. Maybe that's what you enjoy doing and that can really grow your top line. The other thing is you might be looking to move into a new market or you potentially might be looking to expand into an additional service. Before you do either one of those things, you need to have a GM in place so the day-to-day -day operations of your current location, your current service can continue to run without missing a beat while you are able to focus on this new endeavor that you have. So that's when you're gonna hire a GM. So what do you pay this GM? Let's talk about compensation structure. Compensation. We mentioned before on a super. All right, let's say you pay your guys $16 an hour on average. Your TLs, team leaders, let's say it's $16 an hour. You might pay the supervisor 19 to 21 an hour. And after they've proven themselves, you might add in plus 1% sales. Your GM, on the other hand, a lot of this is going to depend on the size of your business. If you're a $500,000 year business, you're going to be on the low end of this. If you're a $3 million, $5 million year business, you're going to be on the other end. And if you're even higher than that, obviously you might even exceed a little bit of these numbers. But typically for a general manager, you're going to be on a salary basis somewhere between $50,000 to $80,000. And then somewhere between 1% uh, to 3% of sales. So a brand new GM, probably gonna be on the lower end of uh, the salary range and on the lower end of commission. As, you're, as he proves himself, or as he or she proves themselves and the business begins to grow and it, may, it stays profitable, and uh, actually the profits grow, and this individual is, uh, uh, the trucks are staying in great shape. They're being maintained like they should. They look great. He's forecasting when to get new vehicles and new people. Uh, the team is growing and the, and, and the retention rates for your team are high. Your customers are happy. The systems are in place to gather customer reviews. He's reviewing them. They're within the range that they need to be with a junk, which in a junk removal company, if you're doing like net promoter score, which is a scale of one to 10, uh, you're going to want to be uh, well above a nine. Uh, at junk removal companies, the customer expectations are low enough that if you're not 9.5, 9.7 on a net promoter score, at least like a 9.3, you're probably doing something wrong and need to look into it. So uh, here's your typical kind of range. Now, what might this be? Let's, let's, let's do a, on a $500,000 business. Uh, let's plug it in at 2% of sales. Let's do $50,000 salary. So let's say you're at 500K in sales. And we're gonna do 2%. It's gonna be 10 grand in commission. So 50K salary plus 10K commish equals a $60,000 a year job. 
All right, let's bump this up. Let's say you've got up to a million dollar year business now. Let's just say it's the same. Well, I'm going to actually bump this up. We get a million dollars a year in sales. At this point, you're probably more along the lines of 70K salary. We'll leave it at that same 2%. So 0.02 times 1 million, about 20K. Calm. At that point, we've got a 90,000 a year business. All right, let's say we bump on up. Junk Doctors this year, uh, our junk over company in North Carolina, we'll do about 3 million. So take that 3 million mark. At this point, this individual is going to be getting that 80K salary and probably 3% commission at that point. That's a 90K commission. So it's going to be 170,000. Yep, 170,000 once you build it up to that level. So, now, there are other ways to structure this. This is just a general uh, common way of doing it that ties in a guaranteed salary with an extra bonus for how the company does. It keeps that person very, very involved on what's most important to you as the business owner uh, of a junk removal company, which is, that, which is that top line. So other ways of structuring this is, you, is somebody might vest ownership over time. So if you have a general manager and you say, okay, over the next five years, I'll vest 25% ownership over to you just so long as we meet these specifications. And what that means is every year, 5% would get vest of ownership would get vested over to that individual. You would probably, if you're going to do that, you would do that in place most likely of any sort of a commission on sales. You might do it for a lower salary. All this stuff is negotiable. Every single part of it is negotiable. But a good GM is going to make you a lot happier and is going to make you a lot of money because it's going to allow you to either one, focus on family life, your hobbies, whatever you got going on. Maybe you're happy with kind of thing where things are. Not that you can't, not, you still have to be involved in the business in setting goals, in, uh, weekly and daily speaking with your general manager, with making sure things are going smoothly, with some big picture marketing uh, initiatives. Ex you really still need to make sure you're expanding at least at some amount, otherwise you're going to be retracting and you're going to be retreating and your company isn't going to be doing as well and that's not good. On the other end of it, it can allow you to really focus in on going into new services and new locations and continuing to expand out your junk removal business. You've got to have a talented person in this role. So one of the most important things about this, because you're talking good money. I mean, you get $170,000 a year income, that's top, definitely top 5% income in America. It's probably even top 3%. Um, so you're talking, you're, you know, you're talking major, major money at that point. So what we have to do is we need to lay out what expectations are with a contract. So a contract serves to basically ensure that the verbal things you guys have talked about, in this case, the verbal things that have been discussed don't get forgotten about and there's no confusion because you can have a conversation, Matt and I can have a conversation and if we're not careful, it's possible that he and I talk about one thing, I take it as being one thing, he takes it as being another. And in most, most circumstances, uh, that's not a big deal. But when it comes to something like this, you do want to get it down to the best you possibly can on what types of expectations you expect out of anybody. I named Matt there, but it could be anybody. It could be the GM of your junk removal company is, is more or less what we're talking about here. So what are some expectations from the company that you're going to want to put up in a contract? It's a lot of it's the things I just mentioned, but you want to make sure that it's actually listed in there. So it's daily, you want to, they need to be daily, monthly, 
uh, quarterly and yearly. And I say they need to be, they don't necessarily have to be, but as a general rule, you might want to lay that out in there. Maybe it's not in their job contract, but it's in there. Uh, you could put in their contract that they're responsible for having, um, you know, court meeting quarterly goals that are set by the leadership team on an ongoing basis. So they should be responsible for expected expense percentages. So one of the things some of you guys probably picked up on is we tied in their compensation with top line. We didn't mention anything about profit. Well, you're probably sitting there thinking, well, as a business owner, profit is what potentially matters more uh, than, than the top line does. So what you do is you tie them in on the top line and then you say expect, they need to meet expected expense percentages and you lay that out. So disposal fees need to be somewhere between nine and 12% or eight and 12%. Um, fuel, you might even want to narrow that range a little. Uh, as a general rule, depending on what market you're in, your disposal fees will be between about eight and 12%. But if you're in a market with high disposal fees, you might say, all right, you need to keep them within nine to 11% or something like that. Uh, labor between 25 to 28%. You know, you want to specify some sort of a fairly narrow range, but still allow them enough leeway to um, uh, react and accommodate changing market conditions. As well, it's, po it's possible that in order to grow the top line, they want to have a few more people working, putting out yard signs or door hanger flyers or stuff like that. And that runs the labor percentage up, but it grows the top line, but the top line might lag behind a little bit of the increased labor percentage. So you want to give them a little bit of range in order to operate with them. Uh, it could be leading the morning huddle. Participate in regular leadership meetings. Have all truck maintenance completed um, within recommended service interval intervals. I'm just gonna say maintenance on time. Review current and past sales data using information to project when to purchase new trucks and hire new people. We're just gonna say forecast up here. Review customer surveys and information from follow-up calls to ensure ongoing customer satisfaction. So say ensure customers are satisfied. Efficiently route trucks. And maintain high employee morale. This is a little subjective. You might find ways of measuring that. Um, employee retention is, uh, is a good way of actually measuring that. And it can vary depending on the area that you're in. So all this stuff you would lay out in some form inside of this job contract. And then obviously from the employee standpoint on their side, you're gonna clearly lay out salary, commission expectations, vacation time, all that kind of stuff to where it's clearly laid out. This one position right here, getting this right, finding somebody that takes over the day-to-day -day operations, potentially runs the day-to-day -day better than you yourself do, and allows you to focus on expanding the business is going to be a, the big difference between building an okay junk removal company, maybe one that does a few million dollars a year in sales and you make a few hundred thousand dollars a year off of, to building uh, maybe a 10, a 5, 10, 15 million dollar a year junk removal company in multiple locations, maybe multiple services. Uh, it's just going to be a huge, huge, huge difference between what you can accomplish by yourself and what you can accomplish 
with a, uh, with a strong general manager. One other thing to keep in mind is as you grow, uh, your GM will begin having more people beneath them. So the GM, if you look at these duties right at the start, you know, this might fly up to 2 million, 3 million a year in income. But once you get beyond $3 million a year income, you, you start heading towards that $5 million mark, uh, you're gonna have to have multiple supervisors generally underneath the GM. Uh, you likely are going to need to get an HR an HR and recruiting uh, individual, somebody that just takes responsibility for HR and recruiting for your business. And then the third thing uh, you're probably gonna need to get shortly thereafter is a, is a full-time mechanic. So you're gonna have a warehouse and, and, and parts inventory and mechanic in place. That way they can really repair these trucks as soon as things, you know, something breaks. Um, especially if it's something pretty simple, tarp, tarp systems breaking, dump systems needing some, some, some type of uh, modifications, tires needing to be, uh, you know, plugged, uh, that, that type of stuff. And sometimes you might even find uh, l transmission lines come off or just some routine maintenance that need to get done. Yeah, these trucks are oftentimes under warranty if you're buying them new enough. But sometimes you're going to figure out, you're going to find that I'd rather pay, I'd rather fix it on our own. Maybe it costs 1500 bucks, but I can have it ready today or tomorrow, or uh, I can go through warranty and it might be, a, they might tell me a week. So that downtime is oftentimes worth more than, uh, than waiting to have the warranty actually cover the repair. And as you get larger, all those options open up. So people oftentimes are, are always concerned as they grow. They're like, I don't want to grow because things get too complicated. Well, they don't necessarily, they might get more complicated, but if it's done right, it's not harder. If anything, it's actually easier once you get the structure and the pieces in place to make it easier on you. People getting talented people in the correct positions is the one is one thing and probably the, actually the largest thing that is going to allow you to build an amazing business and is something that most business owners never figure out. So if you figure that part out, you're going to build an awesome junk removal company and maybe one day you'll be up here leading this, uh, leading this discussion. Uh, coming forward on Let's Talk Junk every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern time. Appreciate you guys watching. I am Lee Gobbold with Junk Removal Authority where we help junk removal business owners make more money and live a better life. We will be back live, actually live next week. So make sure to tune in then. 12 noon Eastern time every Tuesday. Thanks for watching. Junk removal business owners, the complete training series for the junk removal industry is out. Learn how to get more customers, grow faster, build an amazing team, get off the truck, and make more money. Check it out.